this ideology of whiteness means making a decision that's ultimately going to be horrific for everybody's health, including your own. Because of their idea that undeserving immigrants and minorities are going to benefit from the same system. And ultimately what they did is they undermined the infrastructure of counties and then states and now as we're seeing the entire country. Still coming up on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. As COVID cases rise across the U.S. South and West, a lot of Donald Trump's most loyal supporters seem adamantly determined to assert their right to put their health at risk for their politics. It all makes you wonder about the politics of political affiliation and belief. And it put me in mind of a conversation I had with Jonathan Metzl, public health researcher and the author of Dying of Whiteness. Just what is it that draws hundreds of people to support politicians and policies that end up shortening their lives? Metzl says, if we don't talk about racism and racial attitudes head on, we're never going to get to the bottom of the problem or turn this situation around. Here's Metzl in one of our very special recorded at-home conversations at the height of the COVID epidemic, speaking to me in early May of 2020. About a year ago, I was traveling Alabama with my friend Mab Segrist, who also writes a lot about whiteness and blackness in American history. And we heard on the radio about what happened when you were giving a reading from your latest book, Dying of Whiteness, how the politics of racial resentment is killing America's heartland. Can you just take me back to that moment for you and, and what happened? Right. Well, first, thank you. It's really great to be here. And I'm, I'm delighted we're having this conversation. My book had just come out. I was giving different talks. And that week I was giving talk a, a talk at the um, Anti-Racist Book Festival in D.C. that week. Um, and I was in I was in this bookstore, Politics and Prose, um, really just talking about the book. And it was a, a pretty remarkable setting. I was it was a very full bookstore. People were all around, um, you know. And we were having, a, a, I think, a really productive conversation. And one of the people who was in the audience was actually a very elderly gentleman who was one of the people who helped my father and my grandparents escape from Nazi Germany. He he stood up. He didn't know our family. Um, but he had stood up and said, I will be a host, I will be a host family for these people I don't even know um, and help them get into the United States. They had been displaced persons for about 10 years. Um, and the point I was making in the talk at that moment was this is what America is like when it's at its best, when it's its most confident, it's most generous, it's most powerful, when we stand up for people in need and we model for the world the true meaning of our democracy. So I was acknowledging this man who was in his mid 80s. And at that moment, I looked up into the back of the store and into the into the kind of into the procession behind everybody. I could see them. Nobody else could with a stream of um, 10 people. Um, and it was kind of trouble from the minute it started happening. They all had the kind of same kind of uniform. Um, they all had a particular kind of haircut, like shaved. I shouldn't make fun of anybody's hair, obviously, but um, shaved on one side and flipped over on the other side. Um, and they all had bullhorns and they just marched up to the front of the store, took over the entire space. So in other words, exactly, exactly the opposite of the point that we were just talking about. And it was a kind of traumatic five minutes when at first it was very frightening. And then people started shouting, trying to shout them down. Um, they left the store. And then we just had, a, I think, a remarkable conversation. I mean, there were a couple hundred people there and we just had a conversation and we just said, here are two versions of America. One is represented by this gentleman and, and kind of what we can be if we model for the world. Um, 
the power of our ideals. And the other is what we just heard, which has also been a prevalent stream in America, which is this idea of kind of a white kind of purity, this idea, this kind of false history that America is uh, originally white and has kind of coursed through things. So it led to a conversation, which unfortunately ties into the bigger conversation we're having now as a country, which is, um, are we democratic and communal and based in public health for everyone, or are we privileging particular kinds of bodies, particular kinds of privilege? Let me ask you how you think about that moment in the context of this one, because if ever we were brought up short by our failings as a society, I think this is one of those moments. I just keep thinking when, when this virus hit, everybody in the world was equally vulnerable um, in, in a certain way um, because we had no immunity as a species. We still don't. Um, and so this was a moment for everybody to band together, right? Um, what we've seen over the course of this pandemic is that the pandemic is highlighting existing social inequities, right? Inequities by race, by socioeconomic class, um, and in a way, I think that societies that come out of this the strongest are going to be the ones that say this virus has put a mirror up to us and it's challenged us to be better on a structural, political, racial level because it's showing us how no one is safe until everyone is safe. I think the societies that come out of this the weakest are going to be the ones that are the most tribal. And unfortunately, I think what we're seeing at least in the rhetoric so far, has been that the kinds of protests that happened at that bookstore are similar to the ones that are happening, you know, um, in these kind of open up, don't wear a mask, bring your AR-15, storm the state house in, in Michigan or in Wisconsin or other places. That doesn't represent anything close to a majority of opinion in, in the United States. Um, every, most other people are afraid. They're staying at home. They're wearing masks. So it's not like that represents all white people um, or all Americans. But but I do think that that ideology is seizing on this moment to kind of weaponize the virus um, in a way that puts very problematic racial ideologies in the front and and I think portends badly not just for this moment but for our ability to come together to fight this horrible disease in the long term. Clearly you're saying there is psychology here we can't ignore. And the resentment comes up for me when I think of how much bending over backwards we as a society do to try to understand white people and have done, especially since the election of Donald Trump. Um, and there is a, a population and a group of particularly young people who say, forget it, let those old people die. Um, we'll move right along. Why do we spend research dollars and time focusing on the most regressive people in our society when, as you started by saying, they get a lot more public attention already than they deserve um, in small protest groups and so on? I'll start with the last part of the question and then that work backwards, because I do think it's important to recognize that um, that communities of color are suffering and dying exponentially right now. And they're they're, they're doing so not because of some underlying biological reason, it's because of structural decisions about, about resources, about uh, infrastructure, about tax base, education, all these things that we have made as a society that evolve out of the unequal society that we've built. And so in a way, this idea of um, very particular majority populations being the most vulnerable um, overlooks the damage that those ideologies are doing um, on a material level to communities of color right now. Now, that being said, I also think that we've oversimplified what those ide ideologies are. And so if we actually want to speak together across political divides in some kind of generative way, um, I do think it's incumbent on us to think about common, common ideals. It's not like we're just completely either painted blue or red in a particular way. It's that the conduits of how we converse with each other right now like Twitter, as a great example, encourage us to fight with each other. Polarization is big bucks for, um, for you know, <laughs> corporations and other kinds of things. And so in a way, it's kind of like, how do we work backward? How do we work backward from that? And it's really a, obviously a complicated approach, but on one hand, we have to continually um, practice anti-racism to think about the work of Ibram Kendi and others. Um, and at the same time, 
how can we form um, common cause against a common enemy right now, <laughs> the coronavirus? And I, I say that because just think about what's happened over the past couple of months. We all started at ground zero. And all of a sudden, all of these things like masks as a perfect example, or um, even public health information, all these kind of things, um, they've been weaponized um, in the service of polarization in ways that make it harder for us to come together. And so I think we need fight back strategies, not just against the other side, but against the ways in which, you know, two months ago, nobody gave a hoot about a mask. It was, you know, a mask. And now it's a symbol of all these things. And so how do we how do we strategize fighting back against that? Because those are the things that divide us against each other and make common solutions in, incredibly difficult. Let's go back to your book um, and the roots of it. You're, you're a, a public health researcher, also a clinician. You decide to look at what is happening in, as you report at Heartland America, um, but you're very clear. Uh, the heartland is not all one race, not all one opinion, not all one party, not all one perspective. Um, talk about what were the kind of the structure of your investigation? Well, I didn't think that I was going to start out honestly writing a book even about whiteness. I, I thought that I was writing a book about why America couldn't get with the rest of the world and, and have um, universal health care. And so the project started really in the aftermath of the passage of the Affordable Care Act. Um, it wasn't a perfect bill by any means. I, I thought about the Affordable Care Act as kind of like, you know, um, your iPhone 1.0 or Atari Pong or something like that, like a technology that was put out in the world that was going to be improved on. But the thing is, the Affordable Care Act was really intervening into a dramatic problem we had, which was under insurance and under treatment. And also, um, you know, people were going bankrupt because they couldn't afford medical care. And so uh, I was living in, I, I am living in Tennessee, but I was in Tennessee at that time. I had just moved to Tennessee. And I thought, here's this great bill that's going to really help people. Tennessee has very poor health outcomes. But unfortunately, people were being told this is a racist plot by, you know, Obama, the African witch doctor, and all these kind of things. And it really led people who needed medical treatment um, to go out and reject their literally their own health care. I talked to people uh, as part of this initial project who were literally on death's doorstep who told me, I'm not going to sign up for the Affordable Care Act. And it's a quote I, 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 I reproduce in the book. As somebody told me, um, I'm not signing up for any program that's going to benefit Mexicans and welfare queens. And so it was this powerful moment for me of just thinking, how, how strong is this ideology of whiteness, of what it means to be white? Um, that someone who really needs medical attention in the most existential ways is instead going to reject this because of their idea that undeserving immigrants and minorities are going to benefit from the same system. And it just started to kind of cascade for me about thinking, what are other examples where this idea of what it means to be white means making a decision that's ultimately going to be horrific for everybody's health, including your own? Are you only talking about people who don't like black people, don't like Mexicans, have explicitly racist kind of opinions? I want to make clear that I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about all white people. I'm not talking about whiteness as a biological category or even as an identity category. What I'm talking about is the power of a particular strain of American politics that is anti-immigrant, anti-government, pro-gun, and all the other things we're seeing playing out right now that really took a foothold in, you know, it, it really in the aftermath of the election of President Obama, the first African-American president. Um, this was being driven by the Tea Party, the Freedom Caucus, other, other kinds of groups. And it basically tapped into some of the more problematic racist lineages of this country um, and, and basically, these were very fringe positions for, for quite a long time. But what happened is it kind of mobilized this resentment of what it meant to have a black president into a political movement that really became much more powerful in the South. And then, as we're seeing with the Trump administration, gained influence over the entire country. And so it, it really was less important to me. I didn't go around asking people, were you or were you not racist individually? Um, Really, the, ri the risk factor was, did you vote for or live in a state or county where the politicians who got elected did things like 
refused to expand Medicaid or made it easy for everyone to get a gun or eviscerated the budgets for public health, uh, for public education um, and public schools, all of these politics were based in a kind of idea that the social welfare state was going to benefit other people. Um, and ultimately, what they did is they undermined the infrastructure of counties and then states, and now, as we're seeing, the entire country. There is a sort of suicidal aspect to all this, but you put your finger on it. When you look into the death statistics around white male suicides, specifically gun suicides, extraordinary data, and data that your book reminded me, the federal government has not been allowed to research or study since 1996. I live every day with, honestly, the power of what that research felt like. I, I was honored enough to be able to speak with people uh, across the Midwest um, and, and across the, um, across the South um, who um, were living in what they called pro-gun communities. They had basically promoted this idea um, that you needed a gun in order to be a citizen, you needed a gun in order to be protected. Um, but what I saw was that there were dramatic rises is in, in, in risk factors in a way, bringing a gun into their home a lot of times um, was leading to dramatic underreported rates of suicide and partner violence um, and other factors like that that were happening in these households and that there was no data on it. It's very similar to what we're seeing now with the pandemic, uh, very little data because it was so political. And anytime anybody would try to say, hey, look, Guns are great, but let's get some training here. Let's get some uh, some help. Let's let's figure out what's a safe way to store a gun. The NRA and other people would swoop in and say, "No way!" You know, to give an inch is to give a yard. And so, in a way, people were being sold this idea that to be white and to be a Midwesterner was to never ask questions about gun safety or gun ownership, even when it was having these horrific um, effects um, and effects that, like again, like the pandemic. Uh, were not being reported or quantified for political reasons. I mean, the data that you find is extraordinary. And from 2009 to 2015, non-Hispanic white men account for nearly 80% of all gun suicides in the U.S., despite representing less than 35% of the total population. Think about the pandemic, right? You know, the pandemic, one thing that the U.S. government uh, did in, in conjunction with gun manufacturers was to sure make it easy for everyone to rush out and get a gun. And they also, there were all these sub, I mean, the best way to get people to run out and get guns is to say, there aren't gonna be that many guns or Obama or somebody's gonna seize your guns. There aren't gonna be that many guns left. Um, and so really what happened was they created this idea that there was a scarcity and people rushed out and they bought um, eight, I think it was an 800% rise in, in guns in many of these states and brought them into their homes. So think about the risk factor here. Here are um, new new gun owners bringing guns into their home at a very stressful moment and a moment when um, you know everybody is social isolating and they're back in their homes and there are kids in the schools, kids in the homes and things like that. So it's just a dramatic increase in, in risk, which if people were looking at the data would have been something I think they would have thought twice about. One of the paragraphs in the introduction that I think sums up things very beautifully is when you're talking about how backlash conservatism, the sort of politics that you saw arising after the election of Obama, um, how that translates into um, backlash governance, which in some ways is what we're seeing now. And you write, the white body that refuses treatment rather than supporting a system that might benefit everyone then becomes a metaphor for and a parable of the threatened decline of the larger nation. Rather than landing a man on the moon, curing polio, inventing the internet, or promoting structures of world peace, a dominant strain of the electorate voted in politicians whose platforms of American greatness were built on embodied forms of demise. Demise you can put your finger on, that you can see and touch and document. Talking about how we move beyond this is how I'd like to spend the rest of our time, Jonathan. On our show, we, we try to talk about how do you shift power, and, and you make a case very strongly that in denying or ignoring some of this psychiatry and, and sociology that you've reported on in this book, we fail to make the progress we need to be making. 
it's not easy, obviously. You're not the only person out there in, in health sciences who's trying to figure this out. But what have you learned about doing this right and doing this wrong? Scolding people, making fun of them clearly is not the answer. I think the greatest skill going forward is not to shout at each other. It's to try to think about how can we come together um, in the face of, of a very common threat. Uh, and, and in a way, what we need now is more efforts to nationally mobilize against against polarization in a way. Um, unfortunately, <clears throat> the kinds of messages that I, I talk about in the book um, become stereotypes. You know, as, as I said before, it wasn't like every single person I met was a uninformed racist kind of person many people were just trying to trying to live their lives and i did become frustrated because of what i did find when i went and talked to people was for the most part not across the board but for the most part when you actually start to talk to people in the real world um they're much more complicated than they seem on social media on twitter where it's like oh they're either you're red or you're blue um somebody benefits by saying that we are just one way or another um but we lose the ability to to collaborate. And so in a way, I, I've been trying since the book um, to think about different examples of places where we actually might try to bridge some of these divides instead of feeling a kind of self-justification of realizing that we are on some kind of moral high ground. Um, you know, ironically and kind of tragically, I wrote the, the, the paperback just came out last week and I wrote the conclusion um, there's a new a new afterward. It was all from well before the pandemic, and it was actually an optimistic <laughs> conclusion because what I wrote was that there are examples of a new kind of bipartisan politics emerging. I was looking, for example, at the gubernatorial race in Kentucky and the gubernatorial race in Louisiana, two examples where centrist Democrats basically built broad coalitions by getting away from jargon, just talking to people about everyday decisions. And what I've been seeing over the course of the pandemic is that those centrist coalitions, whether or not they're centrist or liberal or conservative, I don't care. It's more that they have, they have the tie-in of, of a bunch of different kinds of people. And they've been much more effective, I think, than very polarized states at mobilizing uh, for responses. Louisiana is a perfect example. And so before the pandemic, I actually was feeling quite optimistic that there was some kind of sense across the country that we're kind of tired of all this polarization and people coming together to say how can we kind of work this out because i'm tired of being right or wrong i just want to i want to fix it and but the pandemic understandably has brought out our worst fears and also um, our worst politics the deep sort of thread that the manipulators of whiteness are able to sort of pull on over and over again is this fear of scarcity and this sense, and W.E.B. Du Bois wrote about it, that there really is a, a benefit to whiteness. Um, it may not be great, um, but it might be a little. And I think that in a moment of a pandemic, we're also seeing a reinscription of this sense of there's a scarcity of masks, a scarcity of treatment, a scarcity of health care. Do you fear that that aspect of the, the benefits of whiteness, the boon of whiteness, actually gets stronger in this time? First of all, you're exactly right, and I, I make this very clear in the book and all the work I've done since then, that really these politics of whiteness, of, of the sense of a threat to whiteness, they far and away have the most devastating effects on communities of color who are put at risk by these very politics and the decisions that emerge from them. And so um, at the same time, I mean, just think about all the lessons of the pandemic. If, if there's virus circulating any, anywhere, then everybody's at risk. Um, we are connected and dependent on everything, on, on your doctor, your dentist, but also on your Uber driver, your food delivery person, all these kind of things. So we're all connected. Um, and in a way, the, the true lesson of this pandemic should have been let's strengthen the connections. Let's strengthen the protections for the weakest links that we've not built in our in our own system. And I think there are a lot of historical examples of countries that face these kind of traumatic and traumatizing moments, and they realize that language, that, that, that lesson, right? Um, during the World War II, for example, when um, people in the UK were under threat of bombing and war and starvation, they made a very wise decision, which was let's give everybody equal access to food, let's give everybody access to healthcare because we don't want to have a much bigger problem and so it turned out that 
when the UK government did that, lifespans started to increase during the middle of the Second World War, during a war, um, because they basically democratized access to food and health care. I think the societies that recognize that same language during the pandemic are going to come out of this with a much stronger uh, sense. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not just, of course, race. It's all about um, socioeconomics. The societies that do what we're doing, at least right now, which is to make things less democratic, more polarized, more unequal, are just going to see much more negative effects, not just from the health effects of the virus, but also the economic fallout. And so again, that this is kind of goes back to the sense that we really need to develop skills for talking across political divides um, in ways that might be more communal, more public health related. And again, not to excuse overt racism, but I do think that the failure to be able to talk about some of these issues um, right now is leading us into, I think, dangerous echo chambers. Um, and, I, and I think that's, in a way, God, we almost need like a, a, you know, a new deal or a Marshall plan for, for polarization, <laughs> in a way. I want to thank you, Jonathan Metzl. Really a pleasure having you on the show. Um, Jonathan Metzl is a professor of sociology and psychiatry at Vanderbilt University in Tennessee. His latest book, Dying of Whiteness, How the Politics of Racial Resentment is Killing America's Heartland, is just out in paperback. Um, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much.